Oi, hello everyone. Um, I don't know why I'm so happy today, but I, I, I am in a good mood even though my face is melting <laughs> because I have this huge skin allergy. That's why I'm trying my best to cover it with my glasses. I don't usually wear my glasses anymore because I don't need them anymore for close range. That's one of the best things that ever happened to me with age. One of the few good things that happened to me with age is that I, I, I can see. <laughs> I don't need my glasses for like close range anymore. Uh, but I'm wearing them today because my face is melting, <laughs> especially around my eyes. It's all melting like pudding, <laughs> like toffee pudding I look today. And so that's why I have to cover as much as I can. Unfortunately, I don't have shades right now, so I, I, I'm hoping that this will cover some of it, but I know that it won't. Anyway, uh, so it's a good thing that today what I have for you is an actual audio. Today it's an audio and I decided to do it today because today it, I don't have the face to record <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, I have a huge skin allergy, my face is melting and I'm happy, go figure. Anyway, so um, I'm coming to you earlier today as well because my students are on a short uh, break, um, ahoy for them. And so this is an audio that I recorded very recently. Um, I recorded last year and I, when I first recorded it, I simply did it as a record to myself. This is how I managed to write my book. It's because I record my experiences as I go. And I've recorded my experiences since that I've been having since 2011, uh, my experiences with astral projection. Um, even at the time without knowing that it would turn into a book. It's just that some things that happen to you are so extraordinary that you, you really do need to record them. This particular experience though, this particular exercise in remembrance through astral projection though, um, is so outrageous. It's just so incredibly outrageous that when I recorded it, I was pretty sure, I was like 300% positive that I was not going to share it with anyone. And that I was simply recording it, you know, to my own consideration so that I didn't forget because, you know, that's how it started. I record, th I would record it by writing and so that I wouldn't forget at first by writing. And then after I got my first smartphone, I started recording it through audio as I did here by first iPhone. Um, and so oh, yeah. fasten your seatbelts, everyone, because it's beyond outrageous. And I, towards the end of it, or even around the middle, you'll understand why is it that I really was not, that my first thought was to not ever share it with anyone until I died, like ever. Like maybe after I die, I will leave it to someone and will ask someone to share it for me, not before that. Um, I don't know why I've grabbed the courage to do it all of a sudden. And I feel like it's because it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, I've managed to shed uh, some more skin uh, and reach the understanding that what people think about you really does not matter at all. That whereas I like people, what they think about me really does not matter at all because I like myself way too much. And because, above all, because it really doesn't matter. It's senseless, it's pointless. It, it just, it, it really doesn't. What a, another person's perspective over uh, towards me is worth zero to me. <laughs> Uh, I can't quite explain this to you, but after you shed enough skin, you just reach that understanding because you know yourself now. Now you know yourself. And so it really doesn't matter how anyone else sees it. That's their problem, not yours. If people find me, um, I don't know, um, deluded or what's the other thing that people may accuse me of other than deluded, also maybe conceited because, oh, Selma, you're ever the scientist. You'll never the, the garbage collector. I mean, for real, <laughs> you know, uh, you see, what I'm trying to say when people say about those um, about reincarnation that, oh, people only remember about lifetimes where they've been famous or wealthy or, you know, an ancient Egyptian princess or whatever which is such a bogus, cynical, incredibly stupid, silly argument anyway, because we have all had lifetimes where we have been, because we have all been everything. We have all been everything. Uh, and in my book, I share lifetimes where I've been the worst and where I've been the kindest, where I've been the absolute worst and the kindest, and in a way that most people would never be able to admit. You know, I shared a lifetime where I was pretty much a psychopath. 
and then a lifetime after that where or before that um, where I was a victim uh, so we've been we, we've all been that we've all been it all which is why we are here um and uh <sighs> For me, but there are themes, we have themes also because of the vibrational imprint of our souls and because of the vib my vibrational imprint of this soul, for this this soul that I am, for this particular cycle, this um, energy monad that I am, this, you know, spread across several avatars that I have been for this particular kalpa, for this particular cycle has been the one of the scientist. I've often been the scientist. Um, and most of it is connected to future lifetimes or to future or to lifetimes in other parallel dimensions in other places. Okay. That seems to kind of be the case with this lifetime, um, with this thing that I recorded <laughs> and that you're going to have access to. Sorry for the long intro, but I did feel like given that it's so outrageously out there what I'm about to share it did require a bit of a long intro okay and now you can stop looking at my melted face and uh, <laughs> and I can go put some more ointment and have a couple more antihistaminics and leave you to it um let me know what you think of it in the comments guys I mean you can just say Selma you really exceeded yourself this time that's beyond outrageous or it's silly or it's this or it's that <coughs> guys i'm thick-skinned regardless you know try to be kind because even though i'm in a happy mood my face is still melting so i could use a bit of kindness today have a great one and let me know towards the end of this video what you think of what i've here with just share and if you feel like it's been any interesting or useful or <laughs> leave us a like a share and a subscribe and if you think that it's just totally nuts and crazy you know just keep it moving i mean it's life i won't take it personally guys believe me uh my face is melting i have that to consider right i have i've got priorities right now i have other things to be upset about right now um love you all and hope you enjoy it let me know Okay, so how do I even begin to tell this one? Uh, today is the 28th of um, October 2023 and it's now 12.27 noon, Saturday. But this recollection came to me a couple of days ago. Uh, so that would have been on the 26th of October. Or was it yesterday actually? It was yesterday, so... 27th of October it came to me through um, astral traveling in what we here call dreaming state through astral traveling not astral projection astral traveling because I wasn't my body wasn't awake my body was asleep when then I was in this other lifetime all of a sudden and I don't know how to tell to begin to tell this one um, I was a woman it looked like what could be the future of planet earth not by the environment not so much because of the surroundings but more because of what the nature of what I was doing so once again I'm a scientist it's like the recurrent theme with all of these lifetimes of mine that I tend to have access to but this one time I was a solo one. I wasn't working for any institution. I was more of an independent researcher as I am now. But I was very much hands-on scientist, engineer, technician. I had kind of built this propulsor machine. Actually, let me start from the first recollection. My first recollection is getting inside a lift or an elevator getting inside this lift and the lift looked like one of those 1980s lifts 
Um, it wasn't very fancy or anything, just a normal like 1980s lift. I get inside and the lift is in the middle of nowhere. It's not inside a building. It's a lift in the middle of a patch of countryside. And I'd kind of surrounded the lift. I'd, it seemed to me like I'd built that uh, lift and I'd surrounded it by um, a very feeble type of fence, uh, like, like kind of a structure, a tall structure that was like fenced all over, fenced around. And in the midst of it, in the middle of it, you had a lift. Um, and um, next to the lift, then I came to understand later on in the dream that there was this kind of propulsor machine, a propulsory machine. But anyway, apparently I'd built all that. Not sure whether I'd done it on my own, but that's what what it kind of looked like to me. So I get inside the lift and I'm, as this woman that I was, thing is though that it was one of those where it's me Selma having access to that lifetime that I'm supposed to be having as that other woman but Selma my consciousness is Selma my mind the Selma mind is more present in that body than the other woman so I was kind of figuring out what is it that I was doing in that lifetime like okay it seems like I've built this uh, but who am I what am I doing here how have I built this it's that type of vibe and then I go down the elevator lift, elevator, whatever, depending on whether you're British or American. I'm neither, so sometimes I'm a bit confused as to which word I should use. Anyway, I go down the thing a few floors only. Uh, if it's not in a building, it's obviously going underground. It's going down the earth. And so it's going underground and at one point it stops at this one floor underground and the door's wide open and all of a sudden I'm on another I'm seeing this other planet this other planetary atmosphere in front of me um thing is though before the doors open I remember thinking oh what if it's a planet I knew that once the doors were to open I'd see another I'd be in another planet and in another atmosphere as crazy as this sounds this reminds me of it. And then I, later after the dream, I remember that I'd watched a TV show where this kind of happens. So what this dream tells me is that it's real, that that show was talking about something that is real. So anyway, um, and that eventually we will develop the kind of technology to access other dimensions through this type of elevator device that goes underground. Anyway, I don't know how. I don't know what the science behind it is because in this lifetime... I am not that scientist that I was in that lifetime. So there you go. And so I know that once the doors open, I'll be in another dimension. So it's a bit scary to me. And I'm thinking, if it's another planet, will I be able to breathe? You know, <laughs> once the, if it's another planet and there's no atmosphere, there's no, or there's no oxygen, once it opens, once, once it, cracks open, it cracks open, I'm dead. But this, then I had to remember, oh, but wait, Selma, you're accessing this, this information, this, the memory of this, what could be what seems like a future lifetime through your astral body. It's not your physical body, your, it's your astral body. So your astral, your astral body cannot die, obviously, because of lack of oxygen. It's just it's energy. It's your astral body. So it's fine. I then remember that I was there in the capacity of Selma accessing this other lifetime that I have as this other woman. And so it with my astral body so I couldn't die and so the door opens and sure enough it is another dimension and a whole other planet um it's another atmosphere a very dark one and it seems like it's so dark that I don't know whether it was just nighttime in that planet in that place or whether that's just how the atmosphere of that place is all day long I don't know how many hours a day would have in that place I, I have no idea I was just looking at it I was just looking at it and then I got, I remember getting a bit spooked out and not wanting to step out. So I just closed the elevator. I just closed the elevator door and I just decided to go back up. And it's when I went back up that I looked to my side and I saw the propulsory machine that had actually, I feel, kind of created the elevator for me. So I feel like what I actually devised and, you know, created physically with my own hands and expertise, whatever I had expertise on, I was obviously an engineer of some sort, uh, was that propulsory, that machine, and that the machine 
would create objects like the elevator. The other thing that I noticed once I was back up is that the elevator itself had shift in both um, form and design and everything. And now it was a lot more modern. It was like a, uh, what, a very, very fancy, very posh, golden lace, like the elevator, like the walls were all golden. It was no longer like that shabby 1980s elevator that I'd gotten into it was now laced in gold or golden some kind of golden foil or whatever that was the walls and uh is golden walled and it was very very modern like uh like now it was like a 21st century a fancy 21st century corporate building high-end corporate elevator type of thing and but it, it it also becomes smaller and so small that um it was actually not comfortable for me, I was feeling a bit claustrophobic, so I rushed to open the door so, so as to exit. You know, I just rushed out because it was too small and it was making me claustrophobic. So I don't know what had changed the properties of the elevator, what had shift, shifted the way that the elevator looked. But it could have been a combination between whatever the propulsory machine did to it whilst I was down there having access to this other dimension. I don't know if, you know... I, these particles just communicated with each other and created a different elevator. I, I have, I've got no idea because, again, in this lifetime, I just have not got the science, you know. <laughs> I'm a social scientist in this lifetime, not a Selma, not a hard scientist, as I seem to be in that one, as I am in that one. But anyone, anyway, so I'm out, and then I see this man with the long beard, long white, uh, with a white beard, not too long, kind of medium sized actually. I'm not very good with physical descriptions. Um, you know, I'm not a writer. I, I write literally just so I can describe my experiences and I do the very best that I can. But I'm not, you know, a literary person, so I'm not great at describing things. I'm a scientist. So I I tend to be better at describing, uh, I don't know, machines and scientific phenomena than I am at describing people or environments. Anyway, so had medium-sized, white-ish, grayish, with like, you know, splurges of black kind of beard, kind of beard, uh, man, older man, and he seems to be a father figure to me, if not my father indeed, um, a Caucasian male. I seem to, I don't know whether I was Caucasian or not in that lifetime. I didn't take the time to look at myself. That was not was what was important to me. I was just myself. And he seemed to be either my my dad or a father figure. And he was definitely also a scientist. He was definitely also a man of science. And I feel like I'd learned a great lot from him. And he was uh, engaged also in my project. Uh, I don't feel like he was just interested in the project. I feel like he may have actually helped me put it together. And, um, or not, I don't know, but there was something to it. He was also a man of science and I definitely learned a great lot from him. And he's just talking to me, but I don't remember what he's telling me at this point. And then there, I remember that there were a couple of kids in the neighborhood that wanted to go and take a pick at what I was doing. And one of them was really well-intentioned and the other one was like, you know, kind of, um, oh, one of those really nasty little pests, you know, uh, it was a pest, a pesky kind of kid who did not have a good vibe at all. He had the vibe of a, of a bully, that kid. And he wanted, he had this curiosity towards what I was doing, but I felt like if I, if I'd let him get any close, he would damage the materials. He would try and do something to damage it or two, because he was that kind of kid. He had the energy of a bully. Mind you that when we're having access to these experiences, our astral bodies are a lot more sensitive to energy and to and they are very they are very good at picking up on the energy of another um, astral body of another individual. And so the kid was not uh, a nice kid, and he wanted to have access to my stuff. So I remember that at one point, because he was becoming way too pesky, and I could feel in him the intent of ruining my stuff, of ruining my project. I just I literally physically just removed him. And threw, threw him out of the, the fence. I literally threw him off the fence and told him something like, and if I ever see you around, you know, you'll regret it. I'll do something to you, whatever, something like that. Whereas the other kid was equal, uh, equally as curious, but in a nice side, in a, the other kid had this, I mean, these kids, they might have been something like nine 
eight or nine or ten at at the most. Whereas the other kid was genuinely curious in the good sense of wanting to learn, wanting to know, and he he had this scientific vibe as well. So I picked up on his um, well-intentioned, kind, scientific vibe, and I remember coming to him and saying, regarding you, don't you worry, because when the time comes, I will let you look at it, and you may even work with me. I told him something like that, not with his exact words, but that was the vibe of what I told him. Like, don't worry, I promise that I will let you in someday. Uh, and when I told him, I promise that I will let you in and that I will, I will show it to you someday, what I, what, um, the vibe with which I was telling him this implied that it would also work, that I also would have, would want for him to work with me someday, you know, and I've downloaded ever since I've had this recollection that in the meantime, that kid and I, we did meet in the future and he did work with me. Um, anyway, um, I don't know whether in the same project, but he did because he, I could sense it in him. He was a keen scientist with a keen eye and um, he was well intended on the contrary to the, to the bully, to the other kid that I literally kicked out and threw off the fence and threatened <laughs> pretty much. Uh, anyway, so uh, that was that. And then I remember that I had to go home, you know, it was the end of the day and I was done for the day because I was a bit spooked out by my own findings. I feel like that had been the first time that I'd actually come across the fact that my machine worked, only I couldn't understand too well how. I feel like I myself in that lifetime didn't know exactly the full science of how I'd made that come about. It was definitely science that was completely untapped. And I was messing with things that I didn't completely and fully understand. I have to admit that because, you know, there's no ego to these experiences. And so I, I do feel like I was messing with something that I didn't fully understand, as most scientists usually do when it's something new, you know. Let's face it. Um... And I couldn't totally understand, like, why did the elevator shift? What kind of particle motion, whatever um, interaction is happening here that has... Uh, this, I, could, I could sense, I could feel that I bumped into something. I bumped into something that was far beyond me, that was beyond me, that was still beyond our understanding, even though this was the future of this planet. Or at least it looked like it was a future lifetime. Even though it may also be in linear earthly lifetime, a past lifetime, in another cycle of planet Earth. That could also be the case. But to me, it felt, I'm not saying it was, but it felt, and it felt, you know, there's no science to feelings, but, or there is actually, but I'm not going to get into that now. To me, it felt like it could be, you know, if we follow logic and reason, the chronological linear earthly lifetime patterns, a future lifetime on planet Earth. But again, it could be just another cycle of planet Earth. Uh, as for the environment where I lived, so now I have to go home. It's the end of the day. I'm a bit overwhelmed by my recent findings that I couldn't make sense, that I couldn't totally make sense of. I was a bit spooked out and scary because if we, what would have happened to me if I'd stepped out, you know, do you know what I mean? If I'd stepped out the lift into that dimension while I was down there. So after that, I'm like, okay, I'm just going home. Enough for today. That's enough for a day, for the day. And in the meantime, I'm also getting told, oh, by the way, I remember asking my father or father figure what my name was because I was there. And again, Selma's mind, my own mind was more present in that body. So I'm like, what, do I, what am I doing here? This seems like another lifetime. Who am I? What's my name? And he looks at me funny and he said with, with a face like what? She doesn't remember? Like what happened to her down there for her not to remember? And he told me, Joya something. Let's say Joya, and then a Latino signing name, sounding name. Now, there's a lot to that name that I'm not going to get into in detail. Joya is my mother's nickname in this lifetime, is Selma, and I've had issues. Um, my mother and I have had problems our entire lives. We definitely have a lot of karma there between the two of us. Um, and the second name was a Latino signing, sounding name that could have been something like, I don't know, Vespertina or something. I don't know. It's just, it sounded, it's something that ended in Ina, but I have no idea what it was. And the guy, I made the poor guy repeat the name to me three times so as to make sure that I wouldn't forget about it. And still I did. Vespertina or something, Ina, some word that ended in Ina. And I remember that the that last name of mine, this Latino si sounding last name, was also um, an adjective in Spanish. It's an adjective in Spanish also, but I don't remember what adjective. It's like descriptive of 
feelings or some descriptive of feelings and it ended it Ina because it was applied to me a woman so I don't I don't remember what, that last name but anyway then I'm looking for the way home because I don't know I'm Selma I'm like okay I know that I'm supposed to go to go home but where is home where do I live in this lifetime and then I have to ask this lady I'm like oh and I tell her I'm looking I want to go home but I'm, I can't find my home where I, I don't know where my home is and this lady, and these, uh, I'm surrounded by fields, by the way, by agriculture fields, by farmland. And um, all of these people were working these farms and um, almost like these uh, layered rice fields type of farms. Only I'm not sure that that was rice that they were cultivating. So this lady at one point looks at me. She sees me looking a bit lost and I tell her I'm looking for my home, but I don't know where it is. And she says, what's your name? And I give her my name, the name that the old man earlier on while I was on the job had given me, that the older man that looked like a father figure, if not my father. And Joya, blah, 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 I tell her my name. And she's like, oh, you live right there. You're right there. And she's also looking at me a bit gobsmacked. Like, how come she doesn't remember her, her own name? What's going on with her today, you know? Anyway, she says, you live right there. So she points to these uh, uh, small apartment blocks uh, short very short apartment blocks uh, like maybe two to three floor apart like two two floor apartment blocks and they very much look now, now this is interesting to me they look like those brick laid um council apartment blocks um in england in london the ones that you see in london right and um um you know those council flats but they don't look good or bad. They just, they're just, you know, they look like English council flats, really. But short ones, those two, two floored ones, they're just two floored and they're made of bricks and things. And I just, you know, I, I remember just opening the door and going home. But as I'm getting to that part of opening the door and going home, now I'm no longer in her body. And I can see her doing that, opening the door and going home. I can see that now in the third person. And the older gentleman, who was the father figure, is there opening the door for her, waiting for her. And that's that. And that was it. That was my recollection of that particular lifetime. As always, many questions now about it. I'll try and get some answers over it through meditation and things. But this has been the experience. Um, and again, this is Selma Faria, Selma Marina Fragoso Teixeira de Faria. I'm narrating the, this experience that took place on the 27th of October 2023, uh, on the 28th of October 2023, and it's now 1247. Uh, that's it. I wish I could remember my last name. I wish that it could come to me. Um, but anyway, that's the experience.